Life after Microsoft Windows, a crucial PSA. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of fireside. So good. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video. Today is a technology day. We're going to be revisiting the series that we've putting together with that life after Microsoft Windows instead of life after Adobe cutting the cord. We have moved on to Windows. We've already cut the cord with Adobe five years ago. Now we're trying to cut the cord with Microsoft with Billy the Kid over there, right? And no longer give him our telemetry, all of our data, everything. Microsoft Windows has been stealing people's data since day one, right? But it's getting worse and worse over time. And about two weeks ago or so, it came out that Microsoft was going to automatically include what they call recall. And this recall basically will take a picture, a snapshot of your screen every three seconds. And then it would use your CPU, your processing power to distill it all down and then take that data, whatever that data is, and send it off to Microsoft. Just think about this. If it takes a snapshot of your screen every three seconds, they have everything passwords, every site you go to, what you say, what you do, what you don't do, where you go, everything. They know everything. So people were like just up in arms. They're like, this just, we're not dealing with this anymore. And there was a lot of people that said, hey, we're not doing it. We're moving into like Linux or maybe even going to Apple OS X or something, but we're not doing this whole Windows thing any longer. Now, at that time, Microsoft said, holy sh we need to walk this back. So what they did with Copilot Plus PCs, for example, or even your PC that downloads the latest and greatest update to Windows, the Windows OS, it was normally coming as default with this recall thing where it takes a picture of your screen every three seconds. Well, once again, they walked that back and now they set it to default as off and then you can turn it on if you like. Trust me, if we weren't all up in arms and just saying, listen, we're going to leave Windows, they wouldn't have walked that back at all. They would have left it alone, just like they'd done with so many other things. So Linux was an operating system that I've used in the past. I said, you know what? Is it possible for me to use Linux as a daily driver and just break free of Windows altogether? Is that possible for my daily work? All right, everything that I currently do. So what I did is I made a list, a list of absolute haves that the system has to be able to do. If not, I cannot move to it as a daily driver operating system. And I said, you know what? If you wanna go down this path with me, do the same thing. Make that list. What is the hardware? What is the software that you absolutely have to have working? And what are your, let's say, wants, okay? You have your needs and your wants. So for my absolute needs, not wants, for my needs, I needed NVIDIA driver support, right? GPU support, because I do a lot of video editing. If not, it would be extremely slow. Also mouse compatibility because I have one of these, it's wireless, and it needs to just simply work. I don't need to jump through hoops to be able to get a Bluetooth mouse to work. Also, I need my printers working, printers. I have a standard printer, and then I have a more non-standard label printer, a thermal printer. And that's a little bit harder to find drivers for, and I'm like, well, Linux, I don't know if that's going to be a thing. So the two printers must work. Also, multi-monitor setup. I also need my audio setup, which is a Scarlett two by two. That needs to work 100%. My camera that I'm using right now, which is the Canon R, has to work. And then as far as software goes, I have to have DaVinci Resolve because I don't use Adobe anymore. I don't use obviously Apple because it's gonna be Linux. So DaVinci Resolve would be the NLE or non-linear editor of my choice. So DaVinci DaVinci Resolve needs to work on Linux. Also, I need to be able to have OBS so I can record myself as well as streaming like the JC Live Show on Fridays at 8.30. Why aren't you there? You need to be. Um, also, I need to have like a Lightroom alternative as well as Photoshop and a designer like Affinity Designer, Affinity Publisher for doing my books like this book back here. When I'm doing those designs, I need to have something for that. And then finally, my want would be gaming. 
I wanna be able to game on this thing. That would be awesome, right? To be able to game on it. Well, so far I've tested four Linux operating systems. Started out with Fedora 40, I really enjoyed that. And then I moved into Nabara 40, nice. Then we went to Arch Linux. We use the Cache OS, we tried that. And then finally, right now we're using Mint. And just so you know, this video is being recorded on Linux. What does that mean? That means that a lot on that list has already been fulfilled. I got the OBS working, which is I'm recording right now. My camera's working, no problem. I have my printers working. My NVIDIA drivers are up. The Scarlet for my audio is working. All of this stuff is working and the edit on this video is being done on DaVinci Resolve. So we have DaVinci Resolve also running on Mint. Now, some of the other OSs didn't work out as well. The Arch Linux, which we use Cache OS, I didn't like at all. I loathed it. There was just problems. I just, just to get a mouse to work, it was literally going through hoops. I'm like, just, I, I can't, I can't recommend it to you guys. Then we tried Nabara, which was really good. I really enjoyed that. It's good for creatives and also good for gaming. But the thing was, is I couldn't get my second printer to work, which is, important, my label printer, my thermal printer. That's how I send you guys all of the products that I make. If not, we're gonna end up with a problem. I don't wanna dual boot into Windows just to make labels, that'd be stupid. The same thing holds true with Fedora 40. I love, right now I would say my favorite is Fedora 40 but I couldn't use it because once again, I couldn't get that label printer to work. I might revisit it, We'll see. So the way I'm looking at this life after Microsoft Windows is that I want you to be able to jump into Linux and just simply use it and know that your hardware is gonna work, your software is gonna work, everything's going to work. Obviously your list is gonna be different than mine, but still I have a pretty damn long list here. So if I can get all of this working, it's probably going to be safe to say that you should have equally as good of an experience, for example, like right now, Mint. Mint is working out really well. Now, this video is about two PSAs. Now, the PSA number one would be a crucial PSA. Now, pardon the pun, it has to do with crucial. So, to install all of these operating systems, I bought different hard drives. This is an SSD, this is an NVMe, another NVMe, another NVMe, okay, you follow me, right? So. The reason I did this is because I want each one on a separate drive. So they're not intermingled between each other. And I suggest you doing the same. Now you could dual boot and have two on the same machine and all kinds of other stuff. But if you don't like Linux, it's nice to be able to just go right back to your windows just by plugging in your drive, right? So this right here is my windows. I deliberately took this out of the system so that I can say, you know what? I have to use Linux, okay? This has been out of my system for three weeks now, almost four weeks, and I have not used Windows since. I've been using Linux and making it work. So, there's Windows. This right here is a previous install. This one right here, I believe, was Fedora 40. All right, so I wanted to do another build of Linux Mint to try to do it a little bit differently, okay? To see if I can get it to break, to see if I can get it to run better, whatever. But I know that this one is running perfectly, so I wanna be able to take that out of the computer, put it to the side, and then put in another one. And I'm gonna tell you why that that's important in PSA number two, <laughs> all right? Well, I ended up buying this. This is a crucial NVMe. It is, it states that it's 7,400 megabytes per second. This thing's supposed to be badass, all right? Started installing Mint on it and I got error after error after error. I'm like, what is going on? I ended up trying installing Mint, Linux Mint on this five times. Each time it got a little bit further. One time I got directly into the operating system when I started doing updates it crashed when it downloaded the latest kernel, it crashed. I'm like, what is going on? I just installed it on another NVMe. Why is this not working? So I went and looked up in the logs to see what is going on and sure damn enough, it has all kinds of critical errors. The drive itself is shit. right out of the box, okay? Right out of the box. The WD Black, Western Digital, 
no problem at all. It works flawlessly, never an error. I ended up going and picking up a Samsung when this one failed. I said, you know what, overnight me, a Samsung. I already know that the Western Digitals are working. Let's go ahead and try a Samsung. We know Crucial is crap. So we're, let's try Samsung. Let's see if this is going to work. Sure enough, I bring this in. It says it's about 5,000 megabytes per second. This one is 7,400. Doesn't matter if you're erroring out all the time. And this thing is running perfectly. Matter of fact, the operating system that I'm using right now, the Linux Mint, the new build of Linux Mint is running on this in the computer. Flawlessly. Install, absolutely perfect. All of the updates, perfect. There was not a problem at all. So the bottom line is, is crucial was the problem. I've never seen NVMe's bad just right out of a box. This is the first one. So if you're doing this project along with me, don't buy crucial. That's my personal opinion because you might buy it and then go and try to install Linux and you're having hours and hours and hours of testing and trying and testing and trying. You don't know why there's errors. The reason there's errors is because the drive is crap, okay? And it's getting internal errors. That's why it's erroring out. You don't want to do that. You want to have a good experience. So once again, pick up the Samsung, flawless. Pick up the WD Blacks, flawless. You can even stick it into one of these Evos. This is an SSD. You can stick that into your computer if you don't have a slot for NVMe, either which way. You can go with this SSD or you can go with the NVMe's, whatever you want, the M2s. Just don't go with Crucial. The reason being is I had problems with it. I don't want to see you having problems also. That will be returned. So, PSA number two. When installing Mint, for example, or any Linux distribution or any OS, pull out your current drive. Unplug it. So the operating system sees that that's the only drive on the computer and it does a fresh install, a format of that drive. All right, which is how we want it. Now, you could dual boot and leave the other one in it, but I've seen problems where, for example, with Linux Mint, it will go and delete accidentally because you do something wrong. It will delete your main drive, the one that has Windows on it. Don't do that. Don't do that because if you need to go backwards, you need to be able to have that drive working. And if you go and set it up with that one unplugged and it goes and sets up the new drive as the master drive, it doesn't do this dual boot thing nonsense at all. And you'll be able to then take that Linux drive out, stick your drive back in, boot up the computer, and it's just like nothing ever happened. So that is my suggestion to you. Do not leave your drive that's currently your OS of choice, whatever it is, in there when you're going and installing your Linux distribution. Number one, you could possibly lose that drive, lose the data on that drive. And number two, it will see it as another OS and it will now dual boot. It will go into Grub, which is that bootloader and say, okay, we have this one as the main, this one as a secondary. You don't want all that. You want them to be separate, period. That's my personal opinion. If you need to dual boot, by all means, you can set it up to dual boot. You can even set it up after the fact to dual boot. But for now, when you're trying this out, you're doing this project along with me, have it on separate drives. So this way, at any time, you can unplug the Linux distribution, plug back in your Windows. There you go. You're back to where you left off. Perfect. So two PSAs. Once again, number one, very, very important. Crucial, crucially important. Do not buy this crucial nonsense, okay? Don't do it. That's what it looks like. Don't buy it. There is errors. And if you're going installing Linux and you're seeing error after error after error and you think that there's a problem maybe with your hardware, with your computer or something, there's some kind of incompatibility. No, it's a problem with the NVMe. Don't do that. Once again, pick up Samsung, pick up Western Digital or something else. Just don't pick up Crucial, in my personal opinion. Now I have Crucial for other things, no problem. But that NVMe, problem, all right? And I don't wanna see you with the exact same problem that I have, so pick something else right now. Maybe there's a bad batch currently out there, I don't know. And number two, of course, for the PSA is make sure that you unplug your primary OS, your primary operating system before installing Linux. Trust me, you will thank me a hundred times over. There's a lot of people that are losing their data because they don't know what they're doing, all right? And this way, it's not possible for you to lose your data. 
It is not plugged in. Just simply unplug it. Very, very simple. Anyways, lastly, I want to know from you, what OS do you want me to try? I went over on the Linux distro watch and I wanted to see what are the current top of the tops when it comes to Linux. At the top of the list, you have MX Linux. Then you have Mint and Endeavor OS, Debian, Ubuntu, Manjara, and Fedora. I love Fedora, it was awesome. Pop OS, OpenSUSE, so on and so forth, right? Maybe I'll put the list over here. If you want me to test any of those out, let me know which ones. And if I get a bunch of people saying the exact same one, maybe I'll give that a check, a C, a look-see. I would also like to reinstall Fedora 40 because I really love the operating system to see if I can get that secondary printer to work again. I just put too many hours into it and I didn't want you to have to go through that type of problem that I did. Now, this is of course a specific printer to me, so everything else was absolutely perfect. So as of right now, my favorite, my absolute favorite OS is Fedora 40, but the one that I'm using now, and the reason being is because everything works, that is Linux Mint. Really strong, very, very strong. It is very stable, and a lot of things are automatically recognized. The worst out of all of them was Arch Linux, Cache OS, all right? It was just a, just a mess to me. There was too much that you would have to do to be able to get it to work. It is not for someone that's just moving in from Windows over to Linux. It is definitely not for you. So check those out. Let me know which ones you want me to take a look at. One last thing, MX Linux. I would not recommend it. Even though it's the number one distro, all right, over there on Distro Watch, my problem with MX Linux is there is no upgrade path for it. If you install MX Linux and then there's a new version comes out, well, guess what? You have to delete that one and reinstall MX Linux from scratch. I don't want you to have to do that. I want you to be able to just simply constantly move up as they change, right? You go with Mint 20, Mint 21, Mint 22 it's currently at. And then when Mint 23 comes out, you can just upgrade to it. That's what I like to see. MX Linux does not allow you to do that. You have to do a reinstall from scratch. I don't recommend it for that reason. Have I tried it yet? No, but just knowing that it doesn't have an upgrade path that's problematic to me. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, throw it a thumbs up. That'll be very helpful. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are, thank you so much. Click this little button over here, notification button. So when I go live and when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. If you wanna say thank you for all of my hard work, there's a little thank you button right down here. You can give a dollar or two if you like. If not, that's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you haven't downloaded any of my eBooks, check them out. Go to jchristine.com com forward slash books once again jcristina.com forward slash books and and now that we got to the end of this video if you want to see more life after microsoft windows cutting the cord i'll put a link right here click on that you can see everything that i've done so far in this series and hopefully you're coming along on this journey with me and breaking free of billy the kid microsoft windows that telemetry junkie that data scraper that sends off your data into the cloud and then sells it to third parties and tries to sell you other bullshit. <laughs> I'm glad you know how I feel. Anyways, many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you all. Bye.